Sri Ramakrishna describes those days in, in the initial days of tremendous fervor. He says, I would cry out mother and it would seem as if my upper jaw would go to the heavens, would encompass the heavens and my lower jaw would encompass the earth and nether worlds. I would, um, he would continue, he said, I would sit down for meditation and I would hear a clattering sound in my joints and joints would get locked until the meditation would be over. I would have no power to move. Once he saw the uh, a terrible form come out of his own body, a vision, and who threatened him with a trident so that he would finish his meditation with them before he would move. Um, uh, he, he said, I, for years together, I hardly ever slept. He said, I had no sleep in my eyes. There was a time when he lost the power of blinking. He stared, he said, I went to, I would go in front of a mirror and try to close the eyelids, which, and I wouldn't be, I would be unable to close the eyelids of my eyes. And he would weep like a child to the mother. Mother, I loved you so and you have given me this terrible disease. Uh, he thought it was a disease. Everybody told him that he was crazy or he was mad. And yet next moment he would be in ecstasy and he would, he would feel the body is nothing. Let the body go. So like this it continued. In the meantime, his mother and his middle brother, I mean, elder, elder brother Rameshwar, they all got news of their young son and his doings in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar. And that the news they got was he's gone crazy, he's mad. Now they called him to his native village, Kamarpukur, that if you come and relax for some days, maybe you will, he'll recover. And the simple solution that parents had in India in those days, even these days also, I think, is to get the boy married. Once he is married and he has children and he's got a wife to take care of, he'll settle down and be more responsible and stop, stop acting crazy. So they decided to get him married. Now, very, very interestingly, Sri Ramakrishna didn't oppose it. Not only did he not oppose it, he actually actively helped. Uh, when they tried to find a bride, they couldn't. And Sri Ramakrishna told them in an ecstatic mood, Go to, the, to Jairambati, which was the nearby village, to Ram Mukhopadhyay's house, and you will find this girl who's going to be my bride, who's been marked with a straw. Marked with a straw is, actually, uh, it was a practice among the poor farmers in, in those places, that if there was a particularly fine flower or vegetable or fruit, which they would want to offer to God, so they would tie a little straw there, so that nobody else would touch that. It's meant for God. And he, strangely enough, Sri Ramakrishna used that phrase, that there is this girl who's marked with a straw, and uh, she's going to be my bride. And they went, and they actually found that uh, little Sharada, uh, she, was, she was there. <laughs> and in those days, child marriage was quite common. It was a standard practice. She was only five years old. I think Ramakrishna was 23 years old at that time. So the the... But marriage in those days was more like a long engagement. And the child would go back to their parents' house and stay there until she grew up and then she would come. So the marriage did take place. And there are interesting stories like, because their family was very poor, Ramakrishna's family was very poor, they couldn't give the, the traditional golden or silver ornaments to the bride. And they had to borrow it from the rich landowners in Kamarpukur, the Lahas. And, but what happened was the little girl, Sarada, she became quite happy when she, she loved the, 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 the fine jewels. And she, was, she would not give it up easily. And when the time came to return it, they were, everybody was miserable. How could they take the, those jewels away from the little girl? But Ramakrishna was, um, uh, he was not at all hesitant. He said, wait for it, her to go to sleep. I'll take, and she was so gentle and so skillful, he took the ornaments away from her when she was sleeping. When she woke up, she was disconsolate, but then she was consoled, saying that later on when you grow up, Ramakrishna will give you go, go, very, very nice ornaments. Um, Sri Ramakrishna came back to Dakshineshwar, and the same madness took possession of him again. There is a story of how he was, kind of, he was sitting in the evening performing the worship, the Arati of Divine Mother Kali. Rani Rashmani, who is the owner of the temple garden, who is the most important person there, she comes and sits next to him 
to watch the worship. And Sri Ramakrishna, while worshipping the Divine Mother, turns to her, to Rani Rashmani, and suddenly slaps her, saying that, shame, thinking of that here too. The bodyguards and the people all around, they are outraged. They are about to pounce on Ramakrishna and drag him away from there and give him a good thrashing, which they believed he really deserved. But the Rani protected him. She said, stop, don't touch him. He's, he, I mean, she would call him father, Baba, though he was much younger than them. Both Rani and her um, son-in-law, Mathur, would call Ramakrishna Baba. The father is right, because I was, uh, she was involved in a lawsuit, and she was thinking about how the lawsuit would go so, while sitting there in front of the Divine Mother. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna <laughs> uh, immediately saw it in her mind. And he slapped her, saying, shame, thinking of, of that in front of God. I wonder if uh, his hands would be tired slapping people left and right if he, <laughs> if he came and watched us me meditating. <laughs> <laughs> It's good that he's sitting there in a picture. <laughs> but so far, he had gone without any kind of systematic guidance. Now, for the first time, he had one of his gurus. There were a number of gurus, Bhairavi Brahmani, the first of them, then Totapuri, and then others also. But mainly two, Bhairavi Brahmani and Totapuri. So the first of his gurus came, these were enlightened beings. The first of his gurus was a woman, a, wa a wandering nun, uh, Bhairavi Brahmani. One day, by that time Sri Ramakrishna could no longer perform the worship of Kali uh, ritualistically because he was so much absorbed in ecstasies. Another priest had been appointed, um, Haladhari, who had come. So Sri Ramakrishna but would still pick flowers from the garden and make garlands and all of that for, for the Divine Mother. So he was picking flowers when he saw a boat come to the Dakshineshwar temple. The temple itself, those who have not seen it, it's on, right on the bank of the Ganges. So a boat comes there and he saw this uh, beautiful uh, glowing figure in, in ochre robes, uh, flowing hair with a bundle of books under her arm. Uh, this nun step out of the boat. He immediately hurried back to his room and told Ridai that go and call this as a nun on the a Bhairavi. So it's like a female companion of Shiva, Bhairavi. So sh she's there on, on the uh, jetty. She has just come from a boat. Go and tell her about me and bring her to me. Ridai said, why should she listen to me and why would she even know you? Ramakrishna insisted, go, don't, don't waste time, just go and talk to her about me. So Ridai goes and sort of diffidently he mentioned, Mother, there is this Ramakrishna, he wants to talk to you. And she took it very naturally. She said, yes, take me to him. And she goes to Ramakrishna and says, my child, I have long have I searched for you. I was told there were three of you, two I have found, and you are the third. So she had a divine um, you know, kind of announcement premonition that she would have three disciples. Two of them already she had found, Girija and Chandra. They were spiritual seekers, but nowhere as advanced as Sri Ramakrishna. And they were also very interesting because both of them had psychic powers. This is a side to spiritual life. You know, many people fall prey to these psychic powers. I have myself seen um, monks in the Himalayas or in other places also doing a lot of serious spiritual practice, but not really for enlightenment, for, for God, for powers, supernatural powers. So Chandra and Girija both had these powers. Uh, Chandra could predict, could foretell the future, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I think he could also make himself invisible or something like that, something like that. But it, his powers just got him into trouble. He got... Uh, uh, into a scandal later on in life and so on. And Girija had another power, which is, uh, doesn't seem particularly useful. He could project a beam of light from his back. So <laughs> I, I'm sure it comes in useful at night. <laughs> but, for somebody else. Yeah, for somebody else. Yeah. Not particularly useful for him. <laughs> but uh, these were about the extent of their powers. And later they came to meet Ramakrishna. And Ramakrishna could actually absorb these psychic powers, remove the, the obstacles in, 
in the spiritual path for everybody. So if a psychic powers were obstacles, he would remove those also. And Girija and Chandra progressed in spiritual life. Sri Ramakrishna himself had no time for these uh, psychic powers. He, he had no attraction. In fact, he had a strong disgust for them because they diverted spiritual seekers from the spiritual path. He would tell the story of two brothers. The elder brother became a monk at a young age and left home, well, home and hearth. The younger brother became a householder, a very good man, religious man, moral man, did his duties and, and so on. Many, many years later, maybe 12 years or 20 years later, the elder brother comes to visit his younger brother. He's a monk now. The younger brother receives his elder brother, the monk, with great joy and uh, with, uh, uh, with all honor and asks him, brother, all these 20 years you have practiced uh, spiritual discipline, so what did you get? And the elder brother, full of pride, he says, you want to know what I got? Come with me. And they go to the river and the brother says, elder brother says, watch. And the elder brother, who's the monk, walks across the river, doesn't sink. He walks across the river. The younger brother says, hmm, that's great. And he pays the boatman two cents to take him across the river. And he goes across the river and the, his elder brother is waiting there and says, did you see? Well, I, I walked across the river. That's what I got. And the, the spiritual power. The younger brother says, that's great, brother, but... I paid two cents to cross the river <laughs> on a boat. Is that all you got? That opened the elder brother's eyes and he went back and he practiced uh, meditation and prayer to realize God. But that, the point of the story is these are not worth much, these, these spiritual powers, these uh, supernatural powers. The Bhairavi Brahmani started teaching Ramakrishna. They got along tremendously. They would spend all day together. She, would, she lived in a, a place just outside Dakshineshwar and she would spend all day with him and teaching him about Tantra, the Tantric path, and also about Vaishnavism, the worship of Krishna, Rama also. Bhairavi Brahmani, she had a little stone image of Rama. One day, she was worshipping the stone image of Rama and she had got food prepared which she offered to the stone image. And she was sitting in meditation in the forest Panchavati, just outside, just uh, on the edge of the temple. And she saw Ramakrishna coming in an ecstatic mood. And he sat down and started eating the food meant for the deity. And both, when both of them came down to a normal plane of consciousness, Sri Ramakrishna was unhappy. He said, Mother, why do I do these things? Um, this is sacrilegious. But Bhairavi said, no, there is one within you who makes you do these things. And I'm beginning to understand who you are. This is the end of my ritualistic worship. She took the stone image and cast it into the river. Because now I find that God exists within you. Teaching Ramakrishna, one after another, the multiple disciplines, difficult disciplines of Tantra, which take years to practice and are very slippery, as if slippery slope of uh, practice. You know, <laughs> there are funny stories about the tantric way of worship, where, see, there are two ways. One is when you approach God, the pull of the world, the pull of the senses, you can cut it off, stop it using willpower. I shall not indulge in these worldly pleasures. I shall focus all my energies on realizing God. That's the yogic approach. The tantric approach is these these, the pull of the senses, the pleasures of the world, these sense pleasures, they're powerful. Instead of trying to stop them, divert them towards God. Sri Ramakrishna later would teach his own disciples that uh, why should you be worried by lust? If you must lust, you must lust after God. You must be angry, then be angry with God that God is not revealing uh, himself or herself to you. So, so, Sri Ramakrishna achieved God realization. He was already enlightened, so he, in each of these paths, he, he succeeded very quickly. Slowly over time, Bhairavi Brahmani, this, this nun, and she had a powerful personality and she was also uh, very charismatic. Mathur Babu, maybe he was a little jealous or maybe he was a little suspicious that such a handsome woman all by herself it sounds too good to be true. So she, uh, he asked once, sort of half-jokingly to, to Bhairavi, Bhairavi, where is your Bhairava? Bhairava means a male companion of Shiva. 
So sometimes they go together, um, a man and a woman. They're spiritual seekers, but often people would say that uh, they, they have, uh, you know, worldly relationships. So Bhairavi, where is your Bhairava? And she was not daunted at all. She said immediately that there, under the feet of Mother Kali. If you see Mother Kali's image, Shiva is under the feet of Mother Kali, lying prone. Mathur Babu would not let go. He said, Mathur said to the Bhairavi, but that is an immovable Bhairava. Where is your movable Bhairava? I mean, just, just, just a statue. It just lies there. She said, and she just shut him up by saying that, if I cannot make the immovable move, then why have I become a Bhairavi? That means I can actually realize the spirit behind these images and the symbols. She realized, she began to feel that Ramakrishna is not just an advanced spiritual seeker. He is none other than an incarnation of God. God incarnated on earth. What Isha would mention that, you know, that is a phenomenon, story of a phenomenon. In human history, once in a while, God chooses fit to intervene, appear in an incarnation like Rama or Krishna or Christ or Chaitanya. And Bhairavi felt Ramakrishna, that, that that period in history is again before us. I'm quoting Vivekananda. Such a thing is again before us. This is not an ordinary time in human history. Such a thing is again before us. The time of Rama, of Krishna, of Christ is again before us. And Bhairavi came to this staggering conclusion. Not an easy thing to do. At the most, those who thought very well of Ramakrishna, like Rani Rashmani or Mathur, they thought he was a very advanced spiritual seeker. That's it. To th and most people thought he was crazy. To think that this crazy man of God is actually God, is an incarnation of God, it's no, not an easy thing at all. So she decided and she proclaimed this to the incredulity of people around. Um, she said, I will prove it. And she s decided to organize, uh, she decided to organize a, a, you know, a meeting of great scholars, religious scholars, pundits, who would debate this matter and would come to a conclusion about it. So Mathur Babu decided to sponsor it. And the two greatest scholars at that time uh, in, in the neighborhood Vaishnava Charan. Vaishnava Charan was a great uh, uh, Vaishnava devotee, a, a very learned person, very highly respected in the community. He already knew Sri Ramakrishna and respected Sri Ramakrishna. So he was invited. Other scholars, pundits were invited. And the second great scholar who was invited for the debate was um, Gauri Pandit, who was um, a very learned scholar in different systems of Hindu philosophy, a tantric practitioner himself. So they came to debate and, and Bhairavi Brahmani said, I will prove it to these great scholars that this Ramakrishna is an incarnation of God. So that was, you can imagine, a great sensation. People from all around, they came to watch this gladiatorial combat. And, and Bhairavi Brahmani was like a proud mother trying to defend her child. So the first round of meetings was held with Vaishnava Charan because Gauri Pandit had not come yet. And Bhairavi Brahmani gave forth her reasons. These are the signs of an incarnation which you find in the Vaishnava scriptures, which you find in the description of Krishna. If you think Krishna is mythological, well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is very much an historic, <coughs> a historical figure just 500 years ago. And these are the descriptions of his life and uh, what the experiences that he had. And the same things you see duplicated in Sri Ramakrishna, replicated there. This discussion was going on, and Sri Ramakrishna sat there like an innocent child, not, not really helping. You know, he was sitting there and popping some spices into his mouth and, and nodding and saying yes. And once in a while, he would tug at the hem of the cloth of Vaishnav Charan and to point out that this particular spiritual experience which was being talked about, this is how it happened, not exactly like that, this is how it happened. <laughs> Vaishnav Charan was convinced, and uh, he said, I fully agree what you, what you are saying that this is a case of an incarnation. He bowed down and fell at the feet of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was not too <laughs> overwhelmed by this. 
the people are calling him God, his only reaction was, well, thank God it's not a disease. If you think so, that is. <laughs> I'm relieved to know that you don't think it's a disease. <laughs> but what would Gauri Pandit think, the other great scholar who was coming, and he was a force to be reckoned with, uh, he, he had an interesting power, another psychic power. Whenever he would go into these debates, he had a chant, which he would chant with a loud voice. It went something like this. Ha re re re. Uh, and it would go a little further. So it started like this. Ha re re re. And he would chant it with a roar. With a kind of, a, um, you know, a very impressive voice. And the result would be his opponents would be disarmed. They would lose all will to <laughs> debate with him. And he would win the debates. So that, that day he came and he went straight to the... Uh, D debating hall um, where the debate was taking place and Vaishnav Charan was sitting there, the Bhairavi and Ramakrishna had, Sri Ramakrishna had come there and other people had gathered and there was a big crowd and as was his practice, he, the Pandit came in and loudly chanted Ha Re 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 something got into Sri Ramakrishna who was so usually so mild and gentle he jumped up and he shouted Ha Re 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 <laughs> But uh, Gauri Pandit was taken back and he, with an even louder voice, a roar, <laughs> he did, repeated that and Sri Ramakrishna came back with a, an awesome roar which filled the whole hall. And that was the last time that Gauri Pandit ever used that. He, he, his powers, with that, his powers dis disappeared. Something came over Sri Ramakrishna and he absorbed Gauri Pandit's power. And, and the debate went on. The next day before they were going for the debate, Sri Ramakrishna went into the temple of Kali, went into an ecstasy. While coming out of the temple, Vaishnav Charan had come and was about to bow down to Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna climbed on his shoulders in ecstasy. And he, by his touch of his foot, Vaishnav Charan also went into ecstasy. When they came, and they were all shaken by this experience, when they came into the hall to debate, Gauri Pandit said, I'm not going to debate and oppose this. Sri Ramakrishna has bestowed his grace upon Vaishnav Charan. I can't defeat him in debate and I don't want to. And Gauri Pandit gave his verdict. Did Vaishnav Charan say that you are an incarnation of God? I proclaim, let alone an incarnation of God, you are that from which all incarnations emerge. That's what um, uh, Gauri Pandit said. And afterwards, um, Bhairavi Brahmani was vindicated in her understanding of Sri Ramakrishna. Vaishnav Charan continued to be very close to Ramakrishna afterwards. He would come to visit Sri Ramakrishna often. And without care of who thought what, he would openly proclaim that Sri Ramakrishna is an incarnation of God. We have an incarnation in our age. Gauri Pandit, he went further. He did not go back home. He stayed in Dakshineshwar with Sri Ramakrishna day and night. And spent time in, in, in Sri Ramakrishna's company in spiritual talk. Sri Ramakrishna instructed him. His wife and children wrote letters to him to come back to their uh, home. He wouldn't go back when it finally seemed that they were going to come there and take him back by force. Suddenly he came to Sri Ramakrishna once and said, I am leaving, O Ramakrishna, and I shall never come back until I realize God. And Sri Ramakrishna blessed him. Gauri Pandit left and nobody ever saw him again. So that was how, for the first time, Sri Ramakrishna was openly acknowledged as an avatar. Many, many years later, when the devotees, Girish Ghosh, the great dramatist, Ram Chandra Datta, who, who, uh, they started proclaiming that Sri Ramakrishna is an avatar, Sri Ramakrishna was not too impressed. He says, this guy is a lawyer, that guy has a, is, is a, a th he's a theater, he, he's a, <laughs> a dramatist, uh, and they come and, what do they know about scriptures and about uh, avatars and about theology and they, they proclaim me an avatar. Many years ago, you do not know, people like Vaishnava Charan and Gauri Pandit had proclaimed me, me an avatar. He was not too uh, moved by this. At this time, and he practiced other disciplines. You know, the, in the devotional approach, there are different approaches. One is the Shanta Bhava. Shanta Bhava is the peaceful attitude to God. Peaceful attitude to God means where like the sages, the rishis, they would contemplate God as a being, as a presence, as a divine presence. In meditation, prayer and calmness, a kind of calm, tranquil approach to God. 
Another approach is of a servant. Thou art my Lord, I am thy servant. That's another devotional approach. Um, Swami Vivekananda put it well. The approach in Vedanta, in, in devotional uh, Hinduism is, you divinize your relationship with other human beings and humanize your relationship with God. What, how do you relate to other beings? Not as husband, wife, father, mother, child, colleague, friend, enemy. No. They are all God in all these forms. That's one way. And what do you, how do you relate to God? Not as God. As father, as mother, as friend, as master. You are the master, I am thy child. Uh, you are the mother, I am thy child. That was Sri Ramakrishna's main attitude. God is my mother. Um, or it could be the other way around. God is my child. That's called the Vatsalya Bhava. So there are many spiritual seekers in India, even today I have met some, who regard God as Gopal, as the baby Krishna. That's why God comes as a baby. I mean, so say, why should God come as a baby? So the baby Jesus or the baby Krishna, that is a mode in which you can relate to God. God is my child. That's one way.